Today on Applied Science, we're going to talk about superconductors. You've probably seen this cool demo of levitating a magnet above a high temperature superconductor like this. And uh, as it turns out, making superconductor is completely possible in the home shop and involves quite a lot of fun stuff. We've got uh, spontaneously combusting mixtures, you've got hydraulic pressing, and we've got kilns with oxygen flooding. But first, let's check out some of the properties of the finished product that I've made here. The material that we're making today is called YBCO for yttrium barium copper oxide. And this is a high temperature superconductor, but high temperature is relative. We still have to get it down to liquid nitrogen temperatures, so very cold, but not quite as cold as liquid helium, which is what some superconductors require, the low temperature ones. YBCO is a black ceramic material and I'm making it in little discs like this. The shape of it comes from the crucible in which I'm making this. And it's kind of a, you know, it's a fairly dense thing. It feels basically like a floor tile or something. It's really just kind of a, a normal feeling ceramic. And it's pretty brittle in this form too. Uh, you can break this with just a pair of pliers. It's really not that strong. And if we break it, you can see a little bit of crystalline structure inside. The magnetic levitation occurs because of an effect called flux pinning. And basically the crystal is not completely perfect. There's little pinholes where the magnetic field can get through the superconductor. And when we drop a magnet on top, the magnetic field is forced through these little pinhole defects and then can't get back out because the little pinhole is surrounded by a superconductor and there's a current that flows through there. And so it's basically like a little solenoid coil holding the magnet in just that spot. Pretty neat effect. For visual interest, I thought it would be fun to put some of these colored ferrofluids on the levitating magnet. You know, kind of have a levitating droplet of fluid with the spikes coming out and everything. Um, but as it turns out, the colorant in these colored ferrofluids are just like a surface thing. Like they put some dust or something in there. So if you go into the bottle with a dropper, uh, you don't actually get the color out. It's still black ferrofluid in there. But uh, nonetheless, still a cool effect. And then also a neat thing to do is to drop uh, iron filings on top of this and the momentum of the, iron, of the falling iron filings gets caught up into the magnet and causes it to spin around. Uh, it looks pretty cool and I also got some high speed video of this. One of the best tests for a superconductor is the magnetic levitation like we've been looking at. But I also wanted to measure the electrical resistance of my superconductor to see if the transition temperature agreed with the literature. So I came up with a setup to do that. Uh, a while ago, Charles Pack sent me his great uh, temperature logger here. And because this is an open source uh, device, I was able to download the firmware and modify it for doing a superconductor transition temperature measurement. So what we have here is a combination of both devices. We've got the Keithley doing a four wire resistance measurement. And uh, the, the idea here is it's got 100 milliamps flowing through the outer two probes, and then it's checking the voltage between the inner two probes and figuring out the resistance that way. And even at 100 milliamps, the voltage drop between these two inner probes is very small. Um, but what we're doing is, is instead of measuring temperature with this fourth channel on the data logger, it's basically piggybacking on the, the two sense electrodes and capturing that tiny voltage and recording it. And since it's 100 milliamps, uh, everything lines up. So 28 milliohms of real resistance corresponds to 282 uh, units in this thing's uh, storage system. It, it ends up being, I think, tens of microvolts or something. And at the same time that we're recording the voltage on the sample with this channel, we're also recording temperature from real type K thermocouples here. Um, so the whole setup allows us to measure temperature and then the resistance based on this uh, sensitive setup. So you can see the results of the data collection here. Uh, it's actually pretty good. I wouldn't worry about the absolute numbers quite so much. Um, liquid nitrogen is only negative 196, I think, Celsius. And you can see that my measured temperature values go lower than that, which is not really possible. Uh, that's because type K thermocouples aren't really the best way to measure liquid nitrogen temperatures. Uh, but it is what I have on hand, and um, it's actually surprisingly close considering everything else. You can see for comparison that a regular piece of metal just gets to be a better and better conductor the colder it gets. But the superconductor is special in that 
it's getting to be a better conductor as it gets colder and then suddenly when it hits this transition temperature it becomes a full superconductor and the resistance really does drop to zero. It doesn't um, transition to like a, another regime where it's getting better and better. It really goes to, out to real zero. Attaching the leads to the piece of superconductor was not at all easy. Uh, in fact, the, the dumbest way to do it ended up being the most effective. I basically just took this you know, heavy alligator clip and just bit onto it like that, and that's it. That actually worked really well. Some other things that I tried were uh, silver-based epoxy. Uh, this seemed like it would have been a great way to attach you know, a, a small wire, but it, it doesn't work at all. As soon as the thing gets cold, we lose contact. I'm not really sure if the uh, epoxy is shrinking and just making poor contact with the ceramic or what, but that doesn't work. Uh, and then I also was clever, thought I was being clever, and uh, made these um, four-wire Kelvin probes out of pogo pins, and they're nice and spring-loaded, and they have like a really long travel and everything. These don't make contact either. I, I put a lot of pressure on it, and between the uh, springs freezing up from the liquid nitrogen pressure or temperatures uh, and just the small surface area there, those don't make contact either. So uh, just clamp on with big alligator clips. I also tried to film an experiment where I showed the magnetic flux lines being excluded from the superconductor when it becomes superconducting. Uh, and this didn't work, but it's actually correctly showing me what's going on. So this is actually how I found out that high temperature superconductors or type 2 superconductors like YBCO actually let a lot of magnetic flux through them. It's just through this flux pinning that all these weird magnetic levitation effects happen. Um, type 1 superconductors at really low temperatures, like pure mercury, for example, is a type 1 superconductor. Those actually exclude magnetic flux lines. And this experiment, I'm going to try to do this if I ever get access to liquid helium. Uh, the iron filings should move away from the superconductor, showing that the flux lines are going around it rather than through it. But type 2 superconductors, the flux lines do go through. They just get concentrated into these um, defects. If you search the internet for recipes to make YBCO superconductor, you'll find that the most common method is called the shake and bake method. And it's called this because you basically just put the three ingredients together, uh, yttrium oxide, barium carbonate, and copper oxide together in a mortar pestle. You shake it up, you grind it up, and then you put it in a kiln and you heat it up to about 950 degrees C, the bake part of the shake and bake. Then you take it out and you grind it up and you shake it again, and then you put it back in the kiln and you take it out and then you grind it up and shake it and put it back in the kiln. And you do this three or four times. Um, the problem is that when it's in the kiln, it spends about a day at 950 degrees C and then another whole day to cool down. So this whole process can take about a week. And uh, if it doesn't work at the end, like is what happened to me, it's very difficult to debug the process because changing it requires another few days or a week to even find out if the change you made works or not. In any case, the main problem with the shake and bake method is that we really want these three ingredients to be in like atomic um, contact with each other. I mean, we want to make crystals that have yttrium, barium, and copper in them. And so to make that crystal structure, the atoms really kind of need to be almost touching. Uh, the problem is that even if these are super finely ground powders and we put them in a mortar and pestle and grind them, I mean, the, the chunks of material have got to be like, you know, millions or billions of atoms big, right? And so you're only going to form YBCO at the, the place where these chunks are touching each other. And so the point of regrinding it and firing it and regrinding it and firing it is that you keep breaking the chunks open and letting more and more surface area together. So I actually never got this to work. I, I'm sure it can if with enough grinding. Like they talk about sitting there with the mortar and pestle for like 30 minutes of straight grinding. And I, I admit I never got to that level. But anyway, I found a much more fun and effective method of doing this. The pyrophoric process involves finding compounds of yttrium, copper, and barium that are soluble in water, and then we boil the thing down to make this uh, sludge that ignites. And uh, since the three chemicals are all soluble, they were all in you know, intimate contact with each other because they were in solution. So we don't have this problem of big chunks of, of powder like not getting together close enough. In this case, it's easy to find uh, barium nitrate, which is uh, soluble in water, and copper nitrate, which is soluble in water. If we could find yttrium nitrate, that would be great, but typically um, it's, it's hard to find. So what we do instead is add a little bit of nitric acid to the water, 
and then add the yttrium oxide and that will dissolve it into the water. The reason that we use nitrates, one is because it's soluble and also because they are oxidizers. And so since we want this process to generate its own heat, we're gonna use these as oxidizers and the fuel is actually going to be citric acid, uh, also soluble in water. So we put all these things together and then as we cook it, uh, we boil off the water and uh, end up with a very thick sludge. I should point out that this releases some really nasty fumes and so I have sort of a makeshift fume hood. It's actually a very efficient fume extractor and it blows the exhaust out the roof of the garage here. After maybe an hour or two of uh, slow boiling, the sludge is getting hotter and hotter because the water content is going down and the heat input is about the same. So as the water goes away, you know, the temperature starts going up and eventually it gets to the ignition temperature and self ignites. It's a really cool looking process. It doesn't explode, it's just a very quick burning, uh, sort of like burning black powder out in air. Uh, in fact, black powder is very similar. We've got a nitrate and a fuel and we're burning it in an open container so it doesn't explode, it just burns very quickly. And I got some high speed footage of this too. This was actually an interesting shot because the amount of infrared light coming off of the combustion was so high it was overpowering the camera. And so I had to add an extra little infrared filter in front of it. But then also I had to have the fume extractor going because it was blowing, you know, nitric acid fumes and ash and everything out of there too. So I had the, the tube set up and the camera aiming in there and it was, it was kind of an interesting shot. After the combustion is done, we're left with this really loose sort of brown ash. It's very lightweight. In fact, it's so lightweight that some of it just sort of floats out from the hot gases being released during the combustion. I tested some of this in liquid nitrogen to see if it was superconducting, and of course it isn't. Um, we'll talk about why in a minute. But at least all the ingredients have been mixed together perfectly because they were all in solution. And then in the heat of that fireball, all of them got forged together into YBCO. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not quite enough just to have all the ingredients in the right place at the right time. We also have to get more oxygen injected into this thing and then also cool it down very slowly so that it forms nice big crystals. I later found out that you don't have to hydraulically press these if you want to make a pellet. Just putting them loosely into a crucible or a dish, an aluminum oxide dish, and putting that in the furnace and heating it up to about 950 is good enough. You'll actually get a perfectly fine uh, hard disk out of it that way that's, that's uh, mechanically fine. However, if you do want a really nice puck shape without any cracks or anything in it, you might need to hydraulically press it. And I tried this a little bit and had some success, not a whole lot. Um, the pressing die, is the geometry that I have is not very good, and so the die would always jam up. But anyway, I, I did make a few pellets this way, and, and they were kind of okay. So after we're left with a pellet of this pressed brown powder or just sort of uh, loosely tapped down into a uh, crucible, the kiln serves two jobs here. One of them is to get the crystal structure as uniform as possible just by cooling it slowly. And the other job is to get more oxygen injected into the YBCO crystals. Despite all the literature on the internet about YBCO, it's actually difficult to figure out the exact temperature ranges and times needed to do this. You would think it would be pretty well uh, established by now, but there's actually a fair bit of disagreement on the internet about what's going on with all this stuff. So I can report what worked for me. Um, basically heating up to 960 degrees C and then decreasing the temperature, holding for about maybe one or two hours and then decreasing at one degree C per minute. Uh, over the over the down to room temperature with oxygen flowing in is what ended up working for me. At first I had just a thin stainless steel tube that was allowing the oxygen into the kiln and I was using a pretty high rate kind of about uh, 50 sccm standard cubic centimeters a minute and then I realized I could be a whole lot more efficient with the oxygen and also have a better chance of getting the oxygen into the crystal by making like a little container within the kiln so I drilled a hole in the bottom of a uh, crucible and then put it, used it as a lid basically and put it on top of the crucible that was going into the kiln holding the powder. So that way the oxygen would sort of be forced to hang out with the powder that I was trying to oxygenate in there. And I ended up using a flow rate of about 10 sccm. 
Another major problem that I had was that my kiln's thermometer was not quite accurate enough to get the proper temperature for doing this process. So most of the literature says you need to be around 940 to 960, even as high as 1000 uh, degrees C to get YBCO crystals into the annealed state and then start cooling down slowly from there. And so originally I was setting my kiln to 940 and none of my samples were working. I did this probably you know five, 10 times and none of them were any good. And um, eventually I realized that my temperature, that the kiln's reported temperature was not quite right. So you can see inside this kiln, the stock temperature sensor is up there near the roof. And I'm mostly interested in the temperature inside this little crucible within the kiln thing. So I added another thermometer or another type K thermocouple and had that set up with my data logger. And that's how I got the profile to see what the actual temperature was inside there. But I didn't realize I had this problem. And then after I did realize it, uh, I used these um, pyrometric cones to figure out if the uh, temperature at the base of the kiln in here is really what it says they are. These cones are designed to calibrate the temperature of your kiln or test it. And they are made from a specific material that begins to soften at a very specific temperature range. So this one is set to go at just under 1,000 degrees C. And it's kind, of a, it's kind of a hard material. It's actually very brittle. I'll just break this one just so you can see. It just snaps right off. Um, it's, it feels kind of like a ceramic, but it's a little bit lighter weight. It's kind of like, a, like chalk almost or something like that. And uh, the idea is that you put one in your kiln and then start raising the temperature and keep checking on it, looking in there and, and checking on the state of this thing. And when it's folded over, then you know you've reached the right temperature. So a very good way to calibrate your uh, thermometers. So basically, as it turned out, when I was setting my kiln to 940, it was really only about 910 at the floor of the kiln, and none of those samples came out working. So it definitely needs to be hotter than that. Um, I think 950 or 960 is fine. And then in the reading I've done since then, I think maybe the best temperature profile is to go from 960 down to maybe 500, and then you hold there for another eight hours, and then from 500 down to room temperature. And you generally want to go pretty slow, like a degree per minute. Uh, fortunately, well, you need a temperature controller that can um, adjust the temperature slowly enough, basically. And that, that's not so easy. One degree C is actually the minimum uh, rate of travel for my temperature controller. The point of stopping at 500 like this is to get as much oxygen in there as possible. So the like you say, there's these two stages where there's setting of the crystals and then there's like this maximum oxygenation, which happen at different temperatures. The liquid nitrogen that I used in this experiment is indeed homemade. I used my DIY liquid nitrogen generator kind of in express mode. So instead of having the original power supply with the digital control, I've got this big variac that my dad gave me and uh, connected it directly up to the cryo cooler. And then I have a clamp meter here to monitor the current going into the cooler and a power meter to monitor the uh, you know, number of watts going into the system totally. And then I also have this kind of makeshift air dryer here, which is just a, a bunch of silica gel. And the, the intake hose goes to the bottom of this column of silica gel. While reading some of these papers about making YBCO, a lot of times you'll see something like, use a flow of 2 ml per minute of oxygen. But that doesn't mean just get a big kiln and then stick a tube in the side and get 2 ml per minute of oxygen going in there. It almost certainly means use a vacuum tube furnace like this, where there's a quartz tube that goes all the way through the middle, and it gets hot, of course, in the middle, but you can connect process gas or even a vacuum pump to the outside. And I've kind of wanted one of these for a while because there's a lot of other experiments you can do with it that are pretty cool. And I didn't end up needing this since I got the YBCO working in my uh, small tabletop furnace. Uh, but this is an uh, indication of what's to come on the channel. I'm going to use this to make all kinds of cool stuff. And uh, it's, it's not built yet, so maybe that'll even be its own uh, video of putting this together. Okay, see you next time. Bye.